you can start professor yeah uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, uh, public talk by uh, louis Tillin on uh, building a national economy the origins of centralized federalism in india we have three very distinguished uh, experts today uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Louis Tillin, of course, would be the speaker, and uh, Professor Balvir Arura, uh, formerly Professor of uh, JNU, would be chairing the session, and uh, Professor Kailas, who would be joining us in a while, would act as the discussant. Before we go and proceed uh, to uh, the public talk, uh, I would like to introduce our distinguished uh, panel. Uh, Professor Balvir Arura has been uh, the uh, Professor of uh, Political uh, Science at the Center for Political Studies, JNU. He did his uh, BA honors from St. Stephen's College. Subsequently, he did his uh, master's uh, from the uh, Science Po uh, Institute, the Etude uh, Politic, Paris. Uh, and subsequently, he has a PhD from the uh, Pantheon Sorbonne University of Paris One. Uh, Professor Arura has also been the chairman of Center for Multilevel Federalism since 2010. And he has been uh, holding uh, numerous academic and scientific uh, organizations member or as executive uh, uh, for quite quite some time now. He has been uh, awarded the uh, Chevalier Dunst La Order de la Region de Honor the Knight uh, in the Order of the Legion of Honor, which was nominated by the President of the French Republic in 2011. And he has also been uh, given this distinguished uh, award of the Officier Dance La Order de Palms Academy, the Officer in the Order, order of the Academic Palms, which was uh, nominated by the Prime Minister of France. Professor Arora has published this uh, quite extensively on Indian federalism. On, uh, on party politics and on coalitions and on civil service reforms. Uh, we are really thankful to Professor Arura for having agreed to preside over today's uh, talk. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Luis uh, for having agreed to deliver this talk today. Uh, Dr. Luis uh, has uh, a deal from uh, Institute of Development Studies, Sussex. Uh, before that, he seeded her MA uh, in Regional Studies from the University of Pennsylvania and BF from uh, his uh, University of Cambridge. Dr. Lewis has joined uh, King's College uh, since uh, 2011, and she is currently the director of King's India Institute, uh, while holding the concurrent position of reader in politics. She is also holding the concurrent uh, position of uh, being the program director of the MSc in Global Affairs study. Uh, Luis has published very extensively on issues of federalism, democracy, territorial politics, and politics of social welfare recently. Some of our monographs include Remapping India, uh, the politics of welfare, uh, Indian federalism, and her quoted uh, book uh, on the politics of uh, poverty reduction in India, which she quoted with James Stiri uh, Yakandat, Daigo Mayoreno, and James Manor. Luis has also published very extensively in uh, some of the leading journals like Publius, Journal of Democracy, Contemporary South Asia Regional and Federal Studies, Territory Politics and Governance. Uh, and Oxford Development Studies, so and so forth. Uh, we are really uh, thankful to Luis uh, to have to uh, for having agreed to speak today on uh, the topic, which has been published quite recently in Publius, the Journal of Federalism. Thank you once again, Luis, for having agreed to come and speak to us. We are also thankful to uh, Professor Kailas. Uh, is a professor uh, at the Department of Political Science of the University of Hyderabad. Professor Kailas did his uh, uh, master's, MPhil, and PhD from the Center for Political Studies, ZNU. And he has uh, also been faculty at uh, the University of Punjab, uh, NCRT Bhopal, 
for joining uh, the Department of Political Science here in the University of Hyderabad. Professor Kailas has also published very extensively on the issue of parties, coalition politics, on politics of social welfare, as well as on comparative uh, subnational politics in India. Uh, thank you all once again for having agreed uh, to, uh, to come and uh, share your expertise on this very pertinent topic today. This is a part of the series of public lecture that uh, we organize. We also organize a book, uh, a book talk where uh, we invite uh, some of the recent uh, you know, publications, uh, author of recent publications. We have also interesting lineup and Dr. Anaga is uh, obviously in the lineup for, uh, for our most recent book, which has uh, come out uh, with Palgrave Macmillan on uh, caste politics, caste panchayats, to be more specific. We also have Professor Arora who is on the lineup. And we also have uh, quite uh, uh, eminent scholars like uh, Akhil Data on Northeast India, whose book has just come out which says on Hindutva in the Northeast. And we have Chanchal Kumar Sarma and others, you know, who have uh, so far consented to speak to us and share their uh, recent works. So uh, we are really thankful that uh, this uh, talk is a part, a continuation of the uh, host of events, academic events that we organize uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Anaga, who has been the academic event coordinator. Uh, she has all the time been um, uh, making very efficient uh, setup and you know arrangement for uh, such a seamless uh, uh, conduct of uh, uh, eminent and distinguished talks. And uh, this talk, uh, as I have already pointed out, is based on a recent publication by Luis, which came out in Publius. And uh, unlike other works on Indian federalism, which make explicit uh, the uh, the importance of political economy as an important analytic in understanding federal design or or making sense of the way in which uh, uh, federal designs uh, are uh, uh, have implications on on the pattern of uh, of federal subnational relationship i think uh, louis intervention is uh, interesting uh, because she has used uh, quite extensively archival resources uh, which uh, have important bearings on understanding the origins of federalism in India. So uh, I'll, I don't know, intend to stand before you and the distinguished speakers. Uh, so I would hand over the entire session to Professor Arora uh, as uh, the chair of this uh, important talk. So, uh, sir, it's, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, please uh, steer the presentation as you deem fit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swan, and uh, good afternoon, or, or maybe um, good morning to some. Uh, we are really happy to be surrounded by so many friends, and particularly happy to be chairing this talk by Louis uh, Tillen, who has been doing outstanding work on uh, not only Indian federalism, but um, she represents for me in the long line of British scholars that uh, uh, W.H. Morris Jones was one of my gurus, who uh, I, the first book I read on Indian politics was by W.H. Morris Jones. And uh, it, uh, uh, the unfortunately, uh, the British tradition of working on India, um, there was a lull and the whole scene shifted to American scholars uh, for a variety of reasons. But uh, the, for me, Louis represents uh, the latest in this long and illustrious line of scholars who have looked at India with empathy and with understanding. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm particularly happy uh, to be chairing this session. Uh, I must mention that she's also a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Multilevel Federalism. And so we look forward to her visits there too. Uh, of course, uh, um, Kailash, Sneha, Anaga, very happy to be with you today. 
And as Swan said, whatever else I have to say, I'll keep uh, for the uh, for later. But I would like to now uh, invite Louis to deliver her lecture. Thank you ever so much, Balvir and, and Swan, for such a generous introduction. Um, I'm not quite sure how to follow from that. I, I perhaps uh, only by paying homage to my own guru, who's who, James, Professor James Maynard, who in turn uh, was taught by Morris Jones. So I suppose there is there is something in the line <laughs> there. Um, but uh, it is a, a an absolute pleasure to. Um, be here virtually, um, if not physically, surrounded by some of the finest scholars of Indian federalism who have taught me so much, um, but also uh, back speaking to the Department of Political Science in, at the University of Hyderabad. I was trying to remember when I was, was last there, I think it was probably 2016, um, when I presented a paper in, in your research seminar series then, um, which uh, was a it was a very rich discussion at the time, um, so it's it's very nice to be back again. Um, the, the I'm going to share my my screen um, to to talk you through um, the the paper that I'm I'm going to present today. I hope to speak for not much more than than thirty minutes. And, and Balvir, I'd invite you to ask me to wrap up if if I if I start to speak for too long. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a paper that has built out of a, of a larger book project that I'm currently working on. Um, the book is actually not supposed to be about Indian federalism, but <laughs> as a scholar of federalism, I have found it very hard to step away from thinking about how territorial politics shapes the nature of India's welfare state. So the book itself is a history uh, of the development of state interventions in the field of welfare in India. So the, the, the shaping of India's welfare regime from the moment that India joined the International Labour Organization and began engaging in a much more structured way in debates about the introduction of, of social insurance and forms of social security through to the present. And this current paper is a spin-off from that larger book project. Um, because as I began to research the long history of India's welfare regime, I realized that the story of India's welfare state is in its historical origins, as well as in its contemporary incarnation, very deeply uh, connected to the territorial structures of the state and the evolution of Indian federalism. So federalism and welfare really do move hand in hand historically and, and in the present. So let me just share my screen. Um, and get started. I hope someone will gesticulate wildly if you can't see these slides. So as Swan kindly said, the, this paper has recently been published a few months ago in, in Publius, the Journal of Federalism, and it builds on this longer term piece of research about the history of welfare and capitalism uh, in, in India. In brief, what I try to do in this paper is to offer an argument about or offer an explanation grounded in the history of India's political economy for uh, the centralism, which is such a distinctive feature um, of Indian federalism. All of you will know very well those features of the Indian federal system that make it different uh, from older designs of, of federalism that predated the mid 20th century, namely that the union government, the central government has quite strong powers of intervention in the affairs of um, states, uh, that uh, the federal model is designed as one that, it, that really is grounded on a principle of interdependence rather than on separate spheres of the central and state governments in their own domains. Um, and those elements of, of centralism, I think, make Indian federalism particularly important for the comparative study of federalism more generally. What happened in India in the design of the Indian constitution post-independence and after the Second World War was in a way um, 
paradigmatic, not only, as Madhav Kosler has recently said, for 20th century constitutionalism, but also for the direction of um, federalism in a wider range of states from the mid 20th century onwards. Um, and in this paper, I suggest that um, India, much like those older federal systems in, in North America in particular, was grappling with the challenges of um, how to consolidate a national economy um, and to uh, step back from some of the more extreme forms of interprovincial economic competition that had shaped industrial development in the late colonial period. In developing this argument, I don't entirely discredit or you know, seek to jettison the more prominent explanations that we already have for centralism. Um, of course, those have typically focused on the impact of partition, um, a, 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 a kind of an event that meant that Nehru and members of the constituent assembly uh, were keen to avoid the potential for any future secessionist movements that might unravel the nascent Indian Union. That, of course, is the, the most prominent, I think, explanation for, for the, <clears throat> the forms of centralism that we see in Indian federalism. Um, and explanations, too, of India's ability to accommodate its social and, and ethnic diversity have also emphasized the importance of centralism, for instance, in enabling India to create new states, regardless of the opposition of their parent states. So, you know, Article 3 of the Constitution um, has often been highlighted by scholars um, as something which has enabled India to hold together. So a form of centralism that has enabled the accommodation of ethnic diversity and flexibility. We also have newer work by Madhav Kosler um, that was published last year, which has sought to explain India's centralism in a, in a somewhat different way um, as uh, an, imp an imperative that was closely associated with democratization. Um, and so for Kosler, the absolute key to understanding why India adopted a centralized constitution was the desire to reconstitute interpersonal relations at the local level. Um, so, as I say, I don't entirely discredit these explanations, but I think that the that political economy factors have often been given shorter shrift um, in our understanding of federalism than um, than they perhaps should have been. Um, so, the kind of the bottom line, the key takeaway um, from the paper is uh, is the argument that the adoption of a centralized design. Um, was a deliberate effort to avoid the creation of institutions that might pose a challenge to welfare state development. Um, and uh, this was done in order to, to prevent the emergence of race to the bottom dynamics, a more competitive form of federalism that might have otherwise arisen from uh, interprovincial economic competition. Um, so, like earlier accounts, I acknowledge that partition was the moment at which the constituent assembly was able to move away from a more decentralized model of federalism, such as had been imagined um, in the cabinet mission plan, um, a, a, a vision for a, a decentralized a uh, form of, de of, of decentralized federalism that would have been very different to the one that was ultimately enshrined um, in the constitution. Um, as Kostler um, rightly says, uh, the, the announcement of partition enabled the constituent assembly to revert to the earlier preferences um, of key Indian nationalists um, overnight, in fact. Um, and at this point, stage, um, the, constituent, the, the drafting committee of the Constituent Assembly proposed that the Constituent Assembly return to the uh, lists uh, of federal, provincial and concurrent spheres that had been first introduced by the 1935 Government of India Act. What I'd like to suggest, though, that this return to the Government of India Act was not a simple question of building from 
colonialism. This was not simply a, an adoption of, 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 of a colonial era pattern of constitutionalism. What I'm going to show you in this talk is that the way that the distribution of powers in the Government of India Acts were designed, um, and in particular, the ways in which they were, they were amended to enable sent the central government to play a greater role in the coordination in social and economic policy, these features of the Government of India Acts were shaped under pressure from Indian nationalists, their transnational allies, um, who were deeply engaged in these debates about the design of state structures and um, their implications for the construction of welfare states. Um, and that, as, as, I'll, as I'll show you, these, these provisions of the acts were in some cases inserted um, uh, by, the, by the colonial administration under great duress. So let's step back for a minute to understand what, um, what I mean by a, a kind of late colonial race to the bottom. Um, that was emerging in industrial competition. Um, this map is taken from the report of the Royal Commission on Labour in India in, in 1931. Um, and I, and I, 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 I put it here to show you the, the, the geographical um, spread of India's two major industrial sectors, cotton textiles on the one hand, which are represented by triangles on this map, and jute on the other hand, which is represented by a large triangle, a large diamond, um, as you'll see centered in Calcutta. Unlike jute, cotton textile, the cotton textile industry by the early 20th century had expanded um, very far from its traditional home in, in Bombay. And the, uh, the, the establishment of upcountry mills, as, as they were then described, in very many parts of India, contributed to a race to the bottom in standards of labour within the, and, and the costs of labour, rates of pay of labour um, within the cotton textiles industry that was placing increasing pressure on mill owners in Bombay. Um, and from the very first Factories Act in the late 19th century, Bombay's mill owners had therefore been pressuring for all regulation of labor standards to be applied across India rather than left to individual provinces. So right from the earliest forms of labor legislation, Key, industri key Indian industrial interests in Bombay were arguing for the central application rather than provincial autonomy um, in labor legislation. And you have here a quote from the time, from the, from the run up to the, the passage of the 1881 Factories Act, which was the first to impose some uh, standards for labor in, in uh, textiles factories. Um, and following this pressure from Bombay was ultimately applied across India. Um, so this is the, the kind of scenario of interprovincial economic competition that existed um, at the point at which India joined the International Labour Organization at its inception in 1919 um, and began to consider the debates that were happening internationally about um, the regulation of, of labour standards. In Bombay itself, and in the face of a new type of industrial unrest, the first strikes and general strikes that began to happen with growing frequency from the 1920s onwards, uh, administrators in uh, Bombay presidency um, and the first trade unions, um, especially the Bombay, Bombay Textiles Labour Union led by NM Joshi, started to become more interested in exploring some of these new social insurance policies that were being proposed by the International Labour Organization after 1919, especially the question of sickness insurance. And that's a story that I'll, that I'm, that I'll tell elsewhere in, in the book. And as a result of the Government of India Act, the first Government of India Act of 1919, um, the provincial, the, the Bombay presidency and other provinces, in theory, had greater autonomy to consider the adoption of these policies um, at a provincial level. But without central coordination, provinces like Bombay were quite reluctant to take unilateral action. 
if, if Bombay, for instance, was to consider the adoption of a form of mandatory sickness, contributory sickness insurance for industrial workers in textiles factories in Bombay, that would place additional costs on local employers in Bombay that would not be borne by, uh, by mills in other in, in, these, in these other upcountry mills that were able to undercut Bombay um, in their labour costs. Um, and this is a, a kind of classic uh, form of, of, of um, interprovincial competition, not unique to India, but seen in very many federal systems in which uh, the pressure from local employers to avoid um, uh, increasing they, their labour costs um, in relation to, to, to employers in other provinces leads to a ratcheting down of, of, of welfare provision. Um, so right from this period onwards, there were calls from both industrialists in Bombay, trade unions in Bombay, and provincial administ in, administrators for greater central intervention. Uh, but the, the, the colonial preference was very much to leave this to the provinces. Um, and that was also in line with the interests of the jute industry, um, which as I've shown you on that map was concentrated only in Calcutta, also in, in Anglo-Scottish hands, not Indian hands, really resistant to any central imposition of um, uh, forms of labor policy that would increase their labor costs in, in, um, in Calcutta. Um, but as I'm going to show you, Despite this colonial preference to, to leave um, social economic uh, policies to um, at, the, at, at the provincial level, um, as a result of pressure from a whole range of um, interests, both from, from, the, from the side of labor representatives and employers, um, the Government of India Act were gradually amended um, in order to uh, enable greater central coordination. Um, so, this is, I mean, these, these uh, steps are <laughs> very fine, kind of grained piece of, of research to do to follow through the small decisions that were taken across time um, in order to, 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 to shift um, the distribution of powers in these new um, lists in, in the Government of India Act. But this slide sets out the kind of the basic sequencing. Um, so we see uh, the early influence of um, international debates of, on, on labour matters, and that it's delegates returning from the first conference of the International Labour Organization who really pushed the colonial administration to concede a change in the 1919 Government of India Act um, so that labour welfare could also be subject to all India legislation. Um, even having conceded this, in reality, the colonial government continued to resist actually doing any central coordination. Um, so when the ILO asked all of its uh, member states to, for instance, uh, consider the introduction of sickness insurance in the late 1920s, the government of India refused to do this at an all India level and left it to the provinces to take action if they chose. But of course, the, the resistance of local employers prevented any provincial initiative in that domain. We see then um, a series of reports, both uh, produced by the International Congress, the Nehru Report of 1928, which is insistent that industrial matters, including labor welfare, should be exclusively on the central list. So a very strong des desire to move away from the, the decentralized approach um, uh, of the 1920s. The 1931 Royal Commission on Labour, which is the first standing body that brought together representatives of labour, employers and the state to consider um, industrial, the kind of future of, of labour policy. Uh, the Royal Commission argued very strongly in favour of central legislative oversight um, of labour issues. Um, but despite all of this pressure, the first draft of the Government of India Act uh, again, moved labour welfare back down to being a provincial subject. So it even stepped, stepped away from the concessions that had been made in the 1919 Act. It took pressure from the British Labour Party um, in the uh, Houses of Parliament in the UK when the 
uh, the Government of India Act 1935 was 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 being um, legislated on to uh, table um, and and have accepted a provision of the of what was described as the alternative Attlee draft. So the future British Prime Minister Clement Attlee uh, chaired the opposition uh, um, representation on the Joint Select Committee on on the Government of India Act, and it was in this. Um, representation by by Clement Attlee that the arguments of NM Joshi's National Trade Union Federation were put forward in order to um, argue that uh, key areas of, of social policy, of labour policy, like health insurance and pensions, um, should not be placed exclusively on the provincial list. And this was the only amendment to the distribution of powers um, in the 1935 Act. Um, and which was subsequently carried over into the 1950 constitution. So I set this out in some detail because it shows, I think, the significance of arguments by Indian nationalist actors in the, uh, in the 1920s and 1930s who shaped the distribution of powers uh, in the Government of India Act of 1935, which then uh, became the basis on which the drafting committee of the constituent assembly approached its demarcation of powers and retained um, that, that distribution um, from, from the 1935 Act. And here are just a few quotes to illustrate the strength of feeling on, um, on, on this question of the distribution of powers. So this is a quote, I won't read all of these out, um, but this is a quote from the Royal Commission of Labour in India. Um, which draws an analogy between the role that the International Labour Organization was playing on a, on a, on a world stage uh, to the task of designing constitution um, of, of India um, and to really push away from a form of legislation which would uh, really enshrine and institutionalize uh, the interprovincial competition. Um, which would impede the development of a future welfare state. Um, this is a quote from a mill owner, Saravji Mehta, in central provinces in Nagpur, um, who, while admitting the potential desirability of introducing something like sickness insurance for workers in, um, in, in, in uh, the textiles industry, um, was absolutely adamant, like many other employers um, in, uh, in central provinces and, and in Bombay presidency in particular, that any legislation of this kind must be all India um, in, in its scope. Um, and some of this, some of this discontent came out of the experience of, of these uh, pro provinces, such as central provinces and Bombay pre presidency in having introduced maternity benefits, contributory maternity benefits um, earlier on, um, which were starting to impose greater costs on, on employers in these regions that weren't borne by their competitors in other regions. Um, so uh, another voice. And here you have um, inputs from the ILO itself. Um, so this is a submission to the Roundtable Conference, which led to the, the 1935 Government of India Act, which really, you know, sought to drum home the, 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 the potential risks of provincialising labour legislation. Um, so, um, as a result of all of, of all of this, pressure for greater central action, the reality of continued colonial reluctance uh, to legislate centrally on matters of labour welfare. Um, by the eve of the Second World War, um, pressure was really mounting, both from industrialists and labour leaders, for greater central coordination. Um, and calls for the constitution of something what became a national labor conference or the standing committee on on labor um, with standing representation by employers workers and the state um, the first of these national labor conferences was convened um, at the beginning of the war um, and stated as its goals 
um, where it's first chairman stated as its goals, Ramaswamy Medallia, um, the consolidation of India into a cohesive economic unit, um, which is as much our goal as its consolidation into one social or political unit. Um, and this effort was then galvanized by um, Dr. Ambedkar himself uh, after he joined the Viceroy's Executive Committee in 1942, the wake of the Quit India movement, and pushed very strongly for the adoption of a nationwide system of social security, going as far as trying to even bring over Beveridge, who had just concluded the Beveridge plan in in. in in Britain to try and inform the development of a nationwide system of social security in, in India, again, much to the consternation of the Viceroy. Um, and these efforts also find their echoes in the Bombay plan, which insists on the importance of maintaining a coordinating role um, and the strong authority of the central government, um, while also acknowledging the, the importance of, of, of regional autonomy. Um, so, to conclude, um, all of these, uh, what, what I've traced here is a fairly fine-grained history of the ways in which the distribution of powers uh, that uh, the India's Constituent Assembly adopted in 1950 were framed uh, in part by debates about the uh, governance and administration of social and economic policy um, and the kind of welfare state that Indian nationalists and in different ways India's industrialists and labour leaders were imagining for a future independent India. Those arguments uh, shaped in concrete ways the distribution of powers in the 1935 Government of India Act, which carried through into the 1950 Constitution. Um, so the paper concludes then by suggesting that while partition was important um, in giving way to a more centralized vision of federalism, um, this centralized vision of federalism with room, of course, for provincial initiative was one that had been developing among nationalist leaders for much longer. Um, so it was not partition itself that gave rise to the arguments for um, centralism in Indian federalism. I've shown that the reliance on the distribution of powers in the 1935 Government of India Act was not at all the simple adoption of a colonial constitutional blueprint, um, rather in at least in the social and economic domain, the centralized design of Indian federalism, which looks very different to uh, the constraints on central governments in earlier federal systems, especially the United States, um, was informed by this desire to draw a line under the colonial era race to the bottom, a laissez-faire industrial policy that was creating forms of interprovincial industrial competition that was um, deleterious to the interests of major um, industrial provinces, especially Bombay. Um, and that it was these interests that um, shaped arguments about the design of the state as, um, as an adjunct to the construction of a national economy as much as the construction of uh, the new nation that, of course, the Constituent Assembly was also um, seeking to achieve uh, uh, after 1947. Oh, uh, thank you, Yes, and thank you. That was uh, very much uh, within the time limit that you had mentioned. You were bang on half an hour. And so we have plenty of time for questions and discussion, which I'm sure there'll be many. But before that, I'll ask uh, Kailash to uh, come in uh, as a discussant and uh, state what he has to say. Okay, uh, thank you, Louise, for opening another dimension to uh, Indian federal studies. I had read this paper in uh, January first, and I then also thank then Professor Swan and Anaga for giving me this opportunity to actually revisit the paper. Now, I entirely agree with you that the 
uh, most often when people talk of Indian federalism and the notion of a strong center or the centralized model of federalism, it always revolves around issues of national security, okay, both internal and external. So it revolves around issues of, as you mentioned, partition, the riots that followed, and the fear of secession. So about, among the lot of internal factors included, uh, say, the Telangana movement. And when you look at the external dimension, there were this, uh, if you look at Austin's work, for instance, he mentions the killing cabinet killings in Burma, the presence of a hostile neighbor, and also the Cold War. So in this... Yeah. So in this um, first, for the first generation of scholars who worked on the Indian constitution, so this security dimension is the staple, okay? And for federal scholars who look at India, the first generation of scholars who looked at India, so centralization is seen as more in sort of a negative term. Look at KC Ware's work, for instance, would be seen as sort of a problem as something very different from what is normal federalism. Now, subsequent writings on federalism, and I think under the influence of the new institutional revolution, there is this idea that design matters. Okay, so there, there, there is this focus that India's federal design has sort of enabled India to accommodate this diversity. And here in this federal design matters school, centralization doesn't seem to be a problem. Centralization is actually something which has helped keep India together or sort of hold India together. Now, I think your contribution takes off from this second generation of scholarship on federalism. There, there is this rethinking about going back to earlier historical documents, going back to constituent assembly debates and to discussions of the earlier period. And you rightly mentioned uh, Madhav Kosla, for instance, he looks at the constitution as a pedagogic tool, okay, as an instrument of uh, say political education. And he sees centralization very differently from let's say the first generation and the second generation. So for him, centralization was an attempt to sort of build a new civic culture and to sort of, I think, reorganize the relationships among people who come under the constitution, who are governed by this constitution. So, and in your paper, you, uh, you mentioned, you have a completely different uh, note on Ambedkar. For instance, when people usually think about Ambedkar and Ambedkar and centralization, it's usually associated with an attempt to sort of break down caste system and to sort of take off the caste system. Whereas in this work of yours, you bring a new dimension to it. Ambedkar's interest in, say, industrial policy, Ambedkar's interest in labor legislation and his contribution to this, I think that was a new dimension that this sort of adds. Now to the second point that I thought I should make was I thought the distinction that you make in the paper and in your presentation on uh, cotton uh, industry and jute industry was very clever in terms of the ownership. You said the cotton industry was owned by Indians predominantly and the jute industry was owned by the British. And therefore they have very different um, positions as to what they want the center to do. I thought that was very interesting. And also I understand your focus on cotton and jute because cotton and jute were the predominant industries at that particular point of time. So that's, I thought was uh, fascinating. And I thought it could have been carried out a little more further in detail. Maybe in the book, we might have a little more details about uh, this interplay of forces and the relationship that they had with the state. Now. Uh, I want to take a little slightly different understanding of this period, and I draw from uh, Vivek Chibber's work, Locked in Place. And I thought that his understanding of political economy and of this particular period will give us a different picture and which might actually add to it uh, and maybe more nuance your argument. Okay, So I begin with this point that whether race to the bottom is the primary concern of industry at this particular point of time. 
if you use race to the uh, bottom as the primary concern, then the arguments that you make follow. However, if I were to argue that the federal dimension at this point of time was incidental to the debate, and let us take, for instance, let's say uh, almost all late industrializers, almost all late developmental states followed a similar pattern. And the argument is this, that capital is looking to the state to manipulate the environment in which it functions. Okay, capital wants a more friendly environment. And capital doesn't want firms, uh, wants the state to manipulate the firm themselves. So it wants an environment where it is friendly for it to carry on its business and sort of keep away the state from actually interfering in its own work. Now, in this context, for the interest of uh, the, in, it is the interest of capital to have a centralized control, to have centralized control because decentralization is going to increase costs. There are going to be more hurdles. There are going to be more burdens. Now, the point in, at which you are reading, that is uh, till say the second world war, there is this united position, which is there between say, let's say labor and capital have sort of similar interests. Now, the question that keeps coming up I, I, both in January and more recently is that how come these two contradictory, who have contradictory interests have a similar interest in centralization? And I thought that the presentation would actually begin with uh, sort of telling us why two contradictory forces want the same thing. Now, if you look at Vivek Chibber's work and look at what happened subsequently, labor is left holding the wrong end of the stick. Uh, capital gets what it wants. It gets an environment which is conducive for growth for its own development. It gets subsidies, it gets uh, 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 so industries where it's reluctant to go, the state sort of enters. Whereas labor, as uh, Chibber would argue, is actually demobilized and it's sort of actually split. And then if you were to read more closely into, let's say, the Industrial Disputes Act and other labor laws that follow subsequently, labor has it very bad. For instance, I think while... Uh, for instance, the Industrial Disputes Act, for instance, says that states, its states can actually declare any public indus, uh, industry as in public interest for six months or so. So states have the power over uh, labor. Okay, so there is this uh, slight different, maybe you need to look into this factor as well. Then the second issue that I will just flag here is that within uh, capital, there is large firms and there are smaller firms, okay? So you have a distinction in the Indian context, in the industrial policy resolution, IPR, both 48, 56, et cetera, which follow. There's a distinction of there's something called small scale industries, village and cottage industries, which are under the states. Now, if we were to take a more, uh, this com complete picture, then I thought that these other factors also need to have, at least maybe it might be there in the book, but I just thought that we need some mention upfront here so that uh, one gets a more complete picture about how state sort of enters and interferes in welfare or starts providing for welfare. So this is the, uh, these are the two points that I actually wanted to make. And thank you for this presentation and for this work again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Kailash. You've raised some very interesting points. And uh, with uh, your permission, Luis, I think I will, um, add to uh, uh, what Kailash has said, some of my own remarks here, so that uh, you can respond uh, perhaps initially to that, and then we open the floor uh, to others. Now, first of all, I would like to compliment you on the um, archi archival, original archival research, uh, which you have uh, brought in, which shows the complex interplay of forces that were shaping uh, legislation during the colonial era. To my mind, what uh, you bring out 
is that the colonial era, there was a colonial power, but the forces and influences uh, and the results in legislation were an interplay between the nationalists, the Labour Party in England, and uh, the uh, government of the time. So I think that um, is very welcome in adding texture to how policies are made, actually. Uh, to say that um, there was one united uh, think way of thinking in uh, the uh, in London, or that they were totally deaf to what was happening on the ground, uh, is uh, not being fair. Now, having said that, I think what you are trying to do is to uh, read the mind of the founding fathers, because ultimately they were drafting the constitution and. I agree with you, uh, well, let me put it differently. We are all agreed that we have, uh, the constitution gave us a centralized federal system with the possibility of having a centralized multi-level federal system. That option was not closed and that option was later used in some way or the other. Now, this uh, centralized federal system, you're quite right, did not, uh, the, the founding fathers were made of sterner stuff. They were not rocked into it or pushed into it merely by partition. No, I think those who have put the origins of the um, uh, centralized federal system solely at the, um, uh, steps of the doorstep of partition uh, have perhaps being in Delhi because the assembly was here, but partition didn't touch large parts of the country. And it didn't touch uh, Bombay, uh, it didn't touch the South. And more than that, uh, I think the, the basic argument is that the founding fathers were made of sterner stuff they were not going to be bowled over, swayed over by the rioting crowds in Delhi. Having said that, uh, I'd refer you to uh, a paper with precisely that title, The Mind of the Founding Fathers by the late Mohit Bhattacharya. It's a, 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 in a volume that I happen to have co-authored and edited with Nirmal Mukherjee. And there, the interplay between this nascent industrial class, which uh, sought to, uh, towards the latter phase, uh, uh, prove its credentials, uh, its nationalist credentials. We know the close link between the House of Birla and Mahatma Gandhi. We, we know the patriotism of Godrej, the Tatars, the House of Tatars, and so on. This uh, the pan-Indian industrial class was very conscious of the fact that, uh, and this is, okay, I'm overlapping here with a, a point that Kailash raised, is that they didn't want, they wanted a friendly environment. They wanted the government not to uh, have too interventionist a policy. They wanted to be left free. They wanted to be protected from the competition of the rising regional industrial classes. And uh, they of course wanted uh, competition against trade unions and their leaders. Uh, that's but natural. When Granville Austin talked about um, the social revolution, again, I think his work is, is important, but equally important is a book that was 
uh, written by uh, Delhi University Professor Shivani Kinkar Chaube from a counter uh, point, uh, which put the question mark is that, is this constitution, can it be the springboard of a social revolution? Now, that is what uh, there are, the, the merit in what you have presented to us is that it raises as many questions as it answers. And I think we uh, uh, are enriched by it because we need to go deeper into this. There were two or three uh, elements in this whole discussion on why we needed centralization. The one that has been stated and overstated is the fear of fragmentation, the fear of disintegration, the, 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 the taunts of the colonial uh, power as it was leaving that India is a mere geographical expression. So there was this terrible urge to prove them wrong, that no, we, we are a nation and we will stick together. And then to that was added what Kailash mentioned, the international circumstances, uh, India was born, the Cold War and the security dimensions. What uh, I would again uh, draw your attention to is the fact that in the minds of the founding fathers, there was a favorable predisposition to Fabian socialism. There was a desire to incorporate uh, labor welfare and they didn't resist when they thought, and Ambedkar was inclined that way, you know, the dens of inequity and localism, that an evolved center a forward-looking center, a progressive center, would be the best guarantee for bringing about this social revolution, this welfare state that uh, you talk about, Louise. Uh, and this is where I, uh, the questions that come to mind are important, uh, perhaps, for your consideration. Is that if you weigh your arguments against the trend of the Indian federal system in the post-90 era. We are in the phase of neoliberalism. We are in the phase where um, the, uh, all the controls are being loosened. Industry is being given fair, uh, a looser rein less government, more governance, whatever you call it, all those slogans. And yet, are we any closer to the welfare state? I think that needs to be, uh, that is at the core of the um, puzzle, the dilemma, the, the paradox that we have is that uh, where we, uh, during that phase, uh, getting closer with its, um, the uh, Navratnas, the nine jewels uh, of the public sector, which inspired faith. Because let's face it, in, in India, uh, business is viewed with mistrust. Private business, I mean, they, they, uh, it doesn't inspire confidence. And so there was the Monopolist and Restrictive Trade Practices Act. There was, and then you, you had uh, these huge public sector uh, enterprises, uh, which were encouraged. We are in a totally different world now uh, with disinvestment and the public sector is uh, gasping for breath. Uh, those that are, are still left on their feet uh, know that their days are numbered and that they are up for sale. Where does that leave us in terms of moving closer to the welfare state? 
I think that question haunts me is that um, no, we, we have, what we have seen is that we, if anything, we are uh, further away. You, you uh, cite a number of uh, authors, which I think uh, are very useful in understanding uh, this. And notable among them, someone who is a good friend, uh, Al Steppen, and his theory of the uh, center as demos enabling. Uh, and this, uh, and then the, the other person whom I find very stimulating is uh, Heather Gherkin with progressive federalism and uncooperative federalism, uh, which she wrote under uh, uh, Trump. Now, I'm trying to situate, you know, you, you brilliantly put forward the complex interplay of why on the economic front, the arguments for a centralized federal system uh, held sway, they were strong, they had powerful promoters, they had a receptive, uh, uh, receptive uh, uh, mind in the constituent assembly. That path that they uh, uh, drew out of giving labor to the center, giving health and education to the states. Now, how does that square? Well, the, 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 so a welfare state is built around health and education. It's not built around regulating labor relations. This was clearly the victory of a lobby of big business and uh, good luck to them. They, 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 they played their cards well, but this was not the way uh, the uh, welfare state was going to be built. Uh, I think uh, uh, I don't want to uh, take up too much time. I'll just make one last point. And that is that when you are trying to disentangle the economic, it's political economy. And if I say polity, I would use it in the restrictive sense of uh, internal security, uh, harmony, um, peace, um, uh, civil order, uh, very restrictive sense. And then the society part, we won't uh, uh, dwell too much into because that would take us uh, too far away into um, um, Ambedkar's uh, thinking, which was to my mind very relevant. Today, how do we view this interplay? The centralized federal system is still there in its essence. And yet, economically, uh, that same centralization, uh, there is a decentralizing uh, process underway. And the narrow political uh, element of the of the framework of a centralized federal system, which is uh, an ideology which is centralizing, not uh, centralizing uh, around a, a social, uh, dare I say, religious ideology, but has a totally different uh, approach to. Uh, political economy. I think uh, uh, I, I leave it at that because I, I, I thank you once again for a, an extremely rich talk backed by um, very solid, uh, uh, rigorous research, which we know that you are uh, known for. And I, I think it's uh, uh, something that uh, um, explains
uh, and this rereading of the mind of the founding fathers, uh, you have very nicely shown um, what shaped their minds, the forces and influences, and that they uh, were responding in intelligent ways. I think we one, you know, when you are faced with political actors, that is the primary assumption that one has to make with what was available to them, their response was to the limits of their intelligence in the time. Now, if at that time they had seen the future of India in a different way, let me say it uh, a little sharply, that the centralized federal system was not an end in itself. It was uh, a different vision of India, and to use the other hackneyed phase, a different idea of India that motivated them to create this system. How is it that the same centralized federal system uh, is serving the ends of those who don't share that idea and that vision at all. I think I'll rest my case there. As I said, to thank you uh, again uh, for uh, raising so many interesting questions. And uh, now, uh, if you would like to come in now or let's take more questions, whatever. Um, I'd be happy to do either. There's so much to respond to in what you've both said. I'd be very happy just to give a few responses um, or, or happy to take questions. What would you suggest? I think since um, uh, uh, Kailash was a discussant, uh, um, uh, I think you could, uh, uh, that would be the proper form for you to respond to the discussant. You don't need to respond to me. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I'll, I'll respond to, to elements of what you've both said, but they, you've raised some really big questions that are at the heart of the way that we think about the relationship between state capital and labor which are, of course are, are also constitutive elements of thinking about what goes into making a welfare state and you many of these are questions which i am dealing grappling with in the book and kailash you you, you kind of put, put you kind of um hit the nail on the head as so to speak, with, with a kind of problem that I was also grappling with. In my fascination in with tracing these economic origins for federal design, I was also acutely aware that this was only one part of the story of the state capital relationship. And this is actually why this paper has been published separately to the book. I had to decide it wasn't for the book, it had to stand separately. Um, but there are um, th kind of things in what you said that um, are part of the reason why the paper emerged in the first place. So just let me go to Vivek Chibber to start with. Um, reading Vivek Chibber again, a book that I had you know, known well when it, from when it was published, but reading it again in light of the work I was doing on, on the, the sort of origins of thinking about the welfare state in India, left me quite puzzled, um, especially after I'd dug into this archival evidence, which seemed to suggest that there actually was a strange, perhaps unexpected convergence between uh, major all India employers and uh, labor representatives in the period leading up to the Second World War in a, a kind of a Bismarckian model for social insurance for industrial workers. Um, but reading Vivek Chibber, you wouldn't get that sense at all. So the story that Vivek Chibber tells us is one in which employers were not interested at all in labor welfare. In fact, in fact he goes as far as to say this. Um, and, you know, the story in which capital bends the state to its will is also one that is produced by the, the, the breaking and the, fra the fracturing of the labor movement. I was so puzzled by this that I did a, I went I went to the foot to, to Vivek Chibber's footnotes um, and realized that he his argument stands on evidence from Calcutta 
uh, from the uh, business uh, publication Capital, I think if I remember correctly, Capital, uh, which, which published the views of those Anglo-Scots who were running jute, the jute sector in, in Calcutta. And that led me to, to dig deeper into the archives and uh, where I found that yes, uh, the jute sector on the whole and, and Bengal province more generally was quite opposed to these new forms of social insurance that were being mooted by the ILO and that were being taken up by labour leaders like NM Joshi in, in Bombay. So I realised that actually there's a rather divergent story when we look at different sections of capital um, and their intersection with the nationalist movement uh, in the run up to independence. Um, that story then starts to change. So the argument that I'm making pre-independence, uh, and, and <clears throat> this is the period in which the architecture of social security for India's form, what we now call the formal sector, industrial workers, was put into place. So uh, sickness insurance, Employee Sickness Insurance Act was passed in 1948 um, and had been designed in the early 1940s during the Second World War. The Employees Provident Fund follows fairly soon afterwards um, and, uh, and, and so on. So the this, this series of, 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 of legislation which actually forms what we might think of today as a very, a very truncated welfare state that caters to a tiny proportion of the workforce, 6-7% today of course covered by um, these social security provisions emerged in this rather peculiar period in the mid 20th century in which there was a convergence of interest between uh, leaders of industry, a, a certain sect, section of leaders of industry who were aligned with the nationalist movement or keen to demonstrate their alliance with the nationalist movement and, uh, and emerging labor leaders, especially in Bombay for all the reasons that I've, I've just described. Um, what then happens, and in fact, I'm just writing this part of the book or going back to, to rewrite this part of the book at the moment, um, is that, that that kind of fleeting moment of, of convergence between those interests does, in it does indeed start to fracture. Um, and much of the debate in the 1950s, especially when we look at, at social security and, and the, the idea the, the how the kind of welfare state that had been envisaged in it during during and after the Second World War, how that was actually being institutionalized, is very much a debate about the relative roles of employers vis-a-vis -vis the state uh, in providing insurance for, for workers. Um, and I think the story is one that plays in uh, the interests of employers, ultimately, um, much more than many of the accounts we have at the, of the kind of origins of India's welfareism would suggest that it's a kind of pro, that this is, you know, pro-worker, um, protective welfare regime. Um, so, but thank you. I really enjoyed um, hearing your, your reflections on, on that. And I know there's more in, in what you were saying, but, um, um, but, but I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. The other thing I wanted to comment, which is something that you both brought, brought out, was the role of Ambedkar. In all of this, um, which was also fascinating to me to realise just how pivotal he was um, in the design of social security for the industrial sector, um, especially in, in his period on the Viceroy's Executive Council, which I think is something which is, it is almost absent from every major biography of Ambedkar, very, very seldom have people really focused on, on his role in labor. And the big puzzle for me with Ambedkar is that it is actually Ambedkar himself who seems to have been responsible for limiting the uh, imagination of the welfare state at the point of independence. Um, so so in, I alluded to Ambedkar's attempt to, to invite beverage to India to, to, to kind of, to, to help design a blueprint for secu social security in, in India, which the Viceroy reluctantly uh, conceded to. Beveridge was really keen to, to, to visit India and had all, has all these previous connections to India that I hadn't, I hadn't realised. But the visit falls apart because Ambedkar and Beveridge disagree on what the priority should be um, for, uh, for India after independence. 
And Bedco wants Beveridge basically to come and give the seal of approval to this scheme of social security for, for the industrial workforce. Beveridge says, this is something that you could do at a later stage of industrial development. The focus should be, you know, a much wider conception of social security, taking in agricultural productivity and, and you know, a much, a much wider understanding of what freedom from want would what might mean in the Indian context. So the visit falls apart. And what, what, what we're left with in, in 1948 is the legislation on sickness insurance, which sets up the empl employee state insurance corporation um, and a series of measures which are focused only on the industrial workforce and Ambedkar was insistent that these that, that social that the horizons of social security at this point had to be restricted to um, to the industrial workforce so I do think that there is a kind there is a relationship between the way in which Ambedkar envisages the uh, role of the central state um, the limited, I think, in some senses, horizons of the way he's conceiving of, of social security and welfareism um, in, you know, in, in shaping the, the longer term trajectory of, um, of, of welfareism uh, in India, which kind of, you know, is a, is a way of, of responding, Balveer, to your question of what are we left with today? Is this, you know, what kind of a welfare state is this? Um, but, but thank you both for those really rich comments. Uh, thank you, Louise. Uh, yeah, so I, I, we have a few questions. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, the one is by Bhupendra Kumar, uh, who is wondering whether in your discussion of the centralized federal system in India, uh, the, uh, you did talk about the role of legislation on labor, capital and industry, but what was the role of land and agriculture policies uh, in building this national economy? And then there's another question by Amog Vinyas, uh, who says uh, that the provincialization of economic policy and the subsequent consequence of race to the bottom, that, which is in, in a sense a like motif uh, in your paper, uh, uh, part of the colonial agenda to decentralize India by bleeding Indian enterprises, this is a question of their profits by creating an environment where industrialists undercut each other uh, in order to, I think I'm getting it right, to enable British enterprises to gain. So these are the two, uh, to gain uh, an upper hand in the Indian market. So uh, I think these are the two questions that we have for the moment, if you'd like to answer them. Yeah, so Bupendra, it's a really good question. Um, and I have to confess that I haven't traced uh, the kind of evolution of, of the constitutional demarcation of land and agriculture in the same way that I have um, labor policy. So I can't give you a very clear answer on the, you know, the kind of the history of, of the distribution of powers with that regard. Um, but I, I suppose I would note that, of course, land and agriculture remains our state subjects, much like as, as Belvere, you, you said, education and health. Um, and at least in the education and health fields, I've been really keen to trace their genesis, you know, why they remain, why they remain in, in, in the state list rather than the concurrent list, at least in 1950. And I may not yet have stumbled across the right archives that will help me understand this, but my sense from fairly deep immersion in this, in this, um, in the archives is that there simply really wasn't very much debate about where education and health should sit. Um, these were traditionally thought of as provincial subjects in older federal systems too, and there weren't the strong constituencies pushing for central coordination in these fields as there were, as, as, as there were in, in the case of labor um, and you know therein lies I think maybe part of the answer to why we some of the challenges that we see in the story of universalization of health and education over the longer term that those forces were not as strong at the point um, that the constitution was designed but yeah on land and agriculture I don't have such a clear answer um, and Amog great question um, I mean <coughs> The regulation of labour and conditions of labour in the Indian textiles, cotton textiles sector in the 
in this period was very intimately bound up with the interests of cotton textiles in, in Britain. Um, and so in, in my work, I talk about the pressure that Bombay's mill owners are facing from smaller upcountry mills in India. But of course, they also are also under and have were for longer under uh, extreme pressure from international competition, both British and increasingly Japanese and from other um, newer entrants into, into the textile sector. Um, so uh, yes, you certainly could make, I think, the kind of arguments that you're, that you're gesturing towards there. Right, thank you. Uh, there is another question from Abdul Maid, uh, where he is, I think, bringing us back to uh, the fundamental uh, objectives of Indian federalism, uh, which is to cater to the interests of all while securing territorial integrity. I think here one could also uh, uh, interject uh, the interests of minorities. Uh, it, this is an important issue. I think the, uh, the Gandhian, as well as because Gandhi was shattered by partition, as we know, and uh, it brought uh, to an abrupt end his dream of uh, a lingua franca combining Hindi and Urdu, the Hindustani. And uh, we know that uh, the, uh, the, while you're quite right, that the, uh, the Constituent Assembly was, did not have a knee-jerk reaction uh, and didn't get pushed into centralized federalism. That I think you have very well documented that uh, there was a buildup to it, that it was moving in that direction. But the issue of a secular India, of an India where uh, citizens of different religions would have equal rights was very much at the core of the, uh, I wouldn't even call it the political element or the social element. It was, it was the national dream, the national vision. I'm told Gandhi had worked uh, for that. Uh, and um, so where does it disappear? Uh, in this, this is uh, uh, something that is worrying uh, uh, at this time is that uh, are we looking at a constitution, centralized federalism, which is no longer able to protect the minorities? Now, that was not the original design. The mm, protection of the rights of minorities, if you go through chapter and verse, were very well entrenched. And yet minorities have never felt as insecure as they are feeling today, the constitution stands. Anyway, the, the, I think uh, I, what I'm going to do is to uh, ask some of my um, old friends and colleagues who I see in the audience uh, and notably um, Professor Suri, uh, whether he would like to share some of his uh, thoughts on this. Good, e good evening, Suri. Good to see you. Good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I just put my uh, earphones here. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, you're perfectly audible. Yeah. I, I give my, first of all, my greetings and respects to you, sir. Uh, uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to see you talking, uh, you know, in such a, as usual, as always, give, giving us a kind of a mature understanding. And of course, uh, listening to Luis is always uh, uh, academically stimulating. Uh, ideas, but just I wanted to say, I, I just thought I would say a few observations. I don't know how far Luis will uh, find them relevant because I haven't read the book nor I haven't read the paper fully. 
I just heard her speaking here. The first one, sir, is I think is about the method. That to look at history as a, as a ground of elite manipulation alone is problematic. There are several factors that, that make the go into a policy. I think there is a problem with one school of Western research that this, they tend to see uh, the, the political process, uh, the policy and politics as a field of elite manipulation. I think that poses a difficulty in understanding uh, uh, a multidimensional, uh, as you, as you and I think Kailash were also saying this, that several factors go into making a policy. Uh, so I think what we should steer clear, uh, hearing to Louise, I thought that we should steer clear of these two approaches, either to look at uh, policy and policy process as elite manipulation, or to see that as a kind of mass macro level nationalism operating and then uh, and leading to a formation of a particular polity or particular uh, policy. So there's neither an exorable force of nationalism, nor what's it, inexorable force of nationalism, nor it is merely a, 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 some industrialists or uh, you know, trying to manipulate the, the policy, which was, I think, quite fashionable in 1950s and 60s um, uh, to look at uh, formation of Indian federalism from that perspective. A second one, th sir, I thought uh, that came to my mind is, uh, you know, when, when you pointed out that uh, labor uh, the central government was keeping and then education and health giving to the states. Within, province, within provinces, uh, the contradiction is that while uh, in the states, uh, the, the, the responsibilities of um, education, health, irrigation, agriculture, these were given to the elected representatives, factories, etc., were kept with the governor. So I don't know whether it is merely the, the desire of the, uh, the industrial elite to keep these things with British government and, and hence the British government kept labor and, and also uh, labor even, even at the uh, state's level, whether this explains the, I think I didn't understand uh, Louis word, whether why the colonial government is at the, the race to the bottom. I, I don't know whether the colonial government was actually as if, uh, I think the presentation was as if the colonial government was more in favor of welfare and, and, uh, and the uh, Indian industrialists or against welfare. I think that that, um, uh, that that may have to, I thought because I, I don't have uh, great knowledge in this area as, as you have, as some of the participants in this, uh, in this meeting have. A third point, quick point is, uh, I thought that, uh, uh, you know, how do you explain that some of the some of the native states were more welfare oriented compared to the British government? And in the British government, when the British government left, the, the, the literacy percentage in India was 11.5, around 12%, which was the same as when the British came to India. So, and, 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 and in some of the countries, uh, like in Burma, for example, uh, the, the, the literacy was about 40%. So I, I think the hardly, even though the education, the central government could have contributed so well. Uh, so I think the, 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 how the welfare state has evolved in India is interesting. I think uh, Louis, Louis has raised uh, some important questions in this regard. But, but the point is, how come Mysore is, was much more welfare oriented? How, how come Travancore was much more welfare oriented? How come Kolhapur was much more welfare oriented? So I don't know whether, whether uh, we can say, uh, and princely states con controlled considerable part of India uh, at the time. 
uh, I don't know how much, maybe half of India was controlled by the princely states at that time, or maybe less than that. Uh, but there were some princely states which were uh, very highly welfare oriented and how do we explain that so these are some of the thoughts that random thoughts that came, that came to my mind sir that it was it was not very systematic i'm sorry that i, no, no, uh, I, I, I didn't read that. i didn't read and uh, this fully now i was thinking of raising questions so it is just a kind of random thoughts louise you should excuse me for this kind of uh, you know, uh, 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 random thoughts. Uh, no, no, I think yeah. they are very Thank precious. You, sir. Uh, I think you've made a wonderful contribution to the debate. Uh, I'm sure Louis will take uh, some of these points into account and respond. Uh, now, I, I'm looking at the clock, Louis. I'll just give you one more question that uh, uh, one of the participants has raised. Um, uh, the initials are FR. So I don't know who it is. Uh, and then uh, the, the question is that uh, how uh, uh, it, uh, with all this uh, emphasis on centralized uh, federalism, uh, it has not been able to resolve local cultural and ethnic issues. And uh, here are the two cases cited are Northeast India and DNK. I think this goes much beyond what your what is on the menu that you have laid before us today. Uh, but I, I thought I'd uh, bring it in only because the concerns, uh, and this is an old debate on whether uh, asymmetry can uh, help in uh, attenuating the, uh, the problems of the centralized federal system. But now we, we have, uh, uh, According to the organizers, we have a few minutes uh, before we have to wind up. So I'll ask you to speak and then uh, I'll hand over the floor. I'll ask uh, um, uh, Ananga to interview. Thank you. Um, I, I won't take too long now, but just um, to say to say thank you again. And uh, it's very nice to see you, Professor Suri. I hadn't yeah, actually realised you were in, on the call, uh, so you went on my screen initially. Um, I mean, I just respond initially. I hope that I'm not repeating the earlier mistakes of the Cambridge School. I do, I. I history at Cambridge as an undergraduate, but even by then the Cambridge School was not what the Cambridge School once was. <laughs> so I, I, I hope when you read the paper that you will see that I'm trying to do more, I hope, than present an argument about the interplay of elite interests in, in shaping the constitution. What I'm trying to make is an argument that's grounded in political economy, which really takes seriously the economic forces that were producing particular set of interests in, in constitutional design. Um, with all the limitations that are, of course, you know, inherent in relying on, on historical method and, and archival research. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I'll just, you know, say for now that the paper that I'm presenting here is, is not a paper about the, uh, the, his, the history or design of India's welfare state. Um, that, that is for the separate book, which is not yet finished. Um, so so I, I can't yet offer you an answer. I hope that I will be able to more convincingly give you a, a kind of answer on, on the, the differences between princely states and, and British provinces. Um, but but that's, that's a separate um, project. This is really focused on, on trying to understand the, the history of federal design. Um, but, but thank you. Um, and, and to the question on, on asymmetric federalism, as Balvin notes, um, it take, it's a really important question and it's something that uh, you know, I've, I've also written and thought a lot about. Um, it's quite different to the, to the work I'm, I'm presenting here and it might involve too long a digression perhaps to look at the reasons why asymmetric federalism hasn't perhaps lived up to some of the hopes that its proponents um, might, might have of it, but that might be for another, another day. Um, but so just for now, let me say a, a very um, sincere thank you. This was an extremely stimulating conversation and it feels such a privilege to have, have been invited to, to speak with you all today. And I, I thank you for your very close reading of, of the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, and thanks on my personal behalf. And then I think Anaga will come in on behalf of the University of Hyderabad, the department. 
Sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Professor Soan for bringing such an excellent panel of speakers to us uh, today. And uh, you all have been an excellent uh, chair, excellent speaker, and an excellent discussant. Uh, I would begin by thanking uh, Dr. Louis Tillin, who uh, I think we should thank her for sharing, of course, her work with us uh, today. Uh, but uh, I think uh, her work is important because it sets, uh, and if I may say unconventionally, the problem of or the question of federalism uh, in the larger global uh, political economy of post-World War I and post-World War II uh, induced welfareism, its reception, uh, motivations, etc. We, uh, we owe thanks to uh, Professor Kailash uh, for bringing out through his questions uh, the importance of regional variations when looking at archival material for making uh, general, uh, uh, you know, general uh, drawing general uh, uh, sort of arguments. Uh, and of course, many, many thanks to you, uh, Professor Bhagavir Arora, uh, for uh, sort of extending uh, the scope of the questions that uh, we must ask. And it sort of very much reminded me of uh, the discussions around the beverage report, which are happening in the UK uh, after 75 years of its uh, uh, you know, completion on welfareism, whether it actually led to welfareism, why the Labour Party supported it then, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, anyway, so with that, I think we must also uh, thank uh, Professor Suri uh, for his, uh, you know, uh, always enlightening uh, questions and discussions and interventions. Uh, I will also like to thank uh, all the participants for joining us here today for asking your questions. Uh, and uh, I think with that, uh, we can end the meeting. Thank you again to all of you and uh, have a good day ahead. Uh, for those who, some of you asked questions about whether you can, uh, where you can see the updates for our talks, uh, you could follow the UH website or uh, the UH Twitter handle or the uh, Facebook page. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, which is called University of Hyderabad Department of Political Science, where we will upload this lecture. And you can also find other lectures and the recordings that we've held before. Thank you again. Um, I hope I'm not leaving out anybody who needs to be thanked. No, no, so, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And we hope to welcome uh, you all here physically uh, whenever it's possible. It always be a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah.